Okay. Well, welcome everybody to CDE's first webinar. We're delighted to have over 300 people joining us, us this morning, and we have a wonderful panel of speakers. Let me start with a few house rules. Please can all the participants and the panelists stay on mute. And the speakers, if you'll please keep your video on, except for Lori, and unmute when you speak. We are recording this and this conversation will appear on the CDE website afterwards. Now the COVID-19 crisis has resulted in a new and very complex situation around the world. This is without doubt going to be a marathon, probably a stop-start marathon, but not a sprint. In South Africa, we entered this pandemic and the harsh consequences of a lockdown in a very weak situation. An economy in recession, unemployment at 10 million and rising, a fiscal crisis compounded by our descent into junk status. The challenge the country faces is how to look after all South Africans, how to minimize infection rates, not overwhelm our health system, keep firms alive, and keep as many jobs as possible. We have to find a way to reopen our economy and rebuild in such a way that we have a chance for economic recovery and one that is much more inclusive of all South Africans. We don't know how to do this. There is no playbook. In each country and globally, there will be a lot of innovation, learning by doing, learning as we go along. In this context, we wanted to organize this event to find out how some of the country's biggest companies are dealing with the situation. And we're delighted to have had such a positive response from leading CEOs and chairmen in different sectors of our economy. We have a fabulous panel this morning. Norman Mbazima, Johnny Copeland, Ian Kirk, Tommy Fanzel, Alon Litz, and commenting at the end of our session, CDE chairman, among his many other hats, Lori Dipinar. We have asked each person to speak for five to six minutes in, at the outset. And I should say that CDE is renowned for what you might call our Genghis Khan approach to chairmanship. So please, can we ask speakers to keep to the limit? You will have another chance to talk off, after the others. So I'm going to ask the panel a few rounds of questions, two actually, and then if possible, a bit of time for one or two questions from our, pot, from our audience. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn to Norman Mbazima, Chairman of Anglo-American Platinum. The question I'm going to ask each of you is, how is your company dealing with a ra range of new issues? How are you dealing with employees and their benefits? How are you dealing with subcontractors and a myriad other issues that each one of you face? What are the general principles that are guiding you in the specifics of how your companies are responding and how you see the situation? Norman, over to you, if you'll unmute. Uh, thank you very much, Anne. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Um, the first thing is to say that our new CEO, uh, Natasha Filion, should have been here, uh, but unfortunately she had some prior commitments. We tried very hard to change them yesterday, but couldn't. So apologies uh, for that. So now you have me. Um, how has Anglo-American been affected? I think we are very fortunate that we had a very strong balance sheet going into this period compared to, you know, the last six years we were battling to um, redo our portfolios, et cetera, et cetera, but now we're in very good shape. Um, we're also very fortunate to have the capacity uh, to deal with this in the sense that we've been dealing with HIV and we've been dealing with TB and we deal with occup occupational health diseases such as 
uh, you know, dust and things like that of, over the time. So this set us up well to be able to deal with this. However, we've had a double whammy. Um, and the first is that uh, our a ACP plant uh, went down and we announced this at the beginning of, uh, of, of March, which meant that we could not produce any metal at all from the precious metals plant or from the base metals plant. Um, however, we could produce all from the mines, we could concentrate all, we could smelt it, and we could then hold the smelter mat until the ACP was fixed. Uh, COVID, which came about one week later, actually meant that now we could not produce any oil, we could not do any concentrating, and we could not do any smelting either. So instead of just deferring production, we were now not producing at all. Um, and our turnover is about 100 billion a year, so you can imagine uh, every single day how, 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 how bad that is. And how, what was the effect of that on our suppliers and uh, our customers? We had to declare force majeure on our <coughs> customers and on our major suppliers, especially those who supply concentrate to us for tolling or for, from whom we buy concentrate. I want to stress that doing that doesn't mean that everything that stops. It just means you suspend the agreements, but you immediately go into discussions about how you can help each other through this. And I think we've had very good discussions to enable us to manage both from the customers or from the suppliers and from our point of view to manage uh, the, this kind of period. Uh, now we are at a stage where things are going to reopen, but we're not sure where the motor manufacturers are. The Chinese ones have reopened, but the ones in Europe and the ones in America are still in lockdown. So it's a very uncertain uh, outlook into the future as to what will happen. The smaller suppliers, of course, we, as I said, we're quite strong, so we're able to pay them everything that they want. And those who are continuing to supply essential services, we continue to pay, pay them. So I think they've been uh, in, in, in good stead, except for the fact that, of course, some of them are not able to supply us now because they're also in lockdown or we're not uh, do, doing something. But the most important thing I think to talk about for me is what we're doing with our communities and what we're doing with our employees. Uh, as I said, what were the principles? The principles was to prevent, i.e. to do everything to prevent people getting this coronavirus. Uh, secondly, was to respond. Whilst we do the prevention, people are in lockdown and uh, they, are, they, are, they are stressed and so forth. What can we do to help? And finally, to set ourselves up to be able to restart uh, very quickly. So again, we were in, 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 a, in a good position. So we've done everything. So the increased medical facilities, the PPEs, the masks, ventilators, testing equipment, thermometers and all of that uh, we've been able to, to provide. We've been providing water both by doing boreholes and by tankers. We've been giving food parcels uh, to our, the communities around us. We've been feeding uh, some of the areas where the government has put homeless people in. We've been putting some food in there to help. Uh, and we've been carrying very extensive awareness campaigns so that we can talk about this virus and get the message out what needs to be done when and by whom. And uh, last week we started also assisting on the gender-based violence issue because this has really raised its ugly head again and uh, we're putting some money into that. In addition, we're putting some effort into the national effort. I think only yesterday we announced some $3 million of assistance to the national effort uh, and to seeing that the smaller businesses who may not be connected with us uh, can be assisted. And we'll put a further $1 million as a group into matching what employees might want to do. Recover, we're gonna start very rapidly. And uh, that's really what we want to do, but we will not start anything unless we can be sure We've done everything to protect our employees. But we need to, to contribute very quickly to the economy because our economy is really suffering. And finally, we've been working very well with government. We, we're really supportive of everything that government has been doing. There have been good decisions made, good consultation, good collaboration, good communication, 
And yesterday's 500 billion was just S for us. So with the department, with the presidency, with the Department of Education, with the minerals, with the municipalities, it's been all really, really very good collaboration. And I wish it would be like that forever. Thank you very much, Anne. Great, thank you very much. Um, a lot packed into your, your time. I'm gonna turn to Johnny Copeland, who is the CEO of HCI. Johnny, over to you, same questions. So, um, and uh, everybody here? Um, uh, ACI is a very different business from uh, the previous speakers. You know, firstly, we work in rands, not in dollars. Um, secondly, we're about a hundredth of the size. So we're not in the, in the same uh, kind of league. Uh, thirdly, we're a business that's pulled itself up by using debt a lot. So when you look at the strength or weakness of balance sheet, we're a business with uh, a lot more debt, uh, relatively speaking, than, than the previous speaker. So it's much more threatening to us uh, uh, to shut down. We're a holding company. We, we don't, we have 20 employees of our own. But um, we have control over a number of businesses that employ probably about 25,000 people. And uh, I guess that's what makes it, uh, you know, more interesting to see how a holding company like this survives. Of those businesses, the primary businesses that we've relied on in the past, which are casinos, hotels, and manufacturing, are all physically closed. I, I don't expect that they will reopen uh, manufacturing will, but the, the hotels and the casinos, generally speaking, will not reopen when the lockdown ends. Uh, if you look at the, the current uh, statement that was put out by, by government now, they expect uh, sit-down restaurants, movies, theatres, places of entertainment to remain closed. And I, I would imagine that is something that will probably persist for most of this year. So when you look at any business and you say, well, look, can you shut it down for nine months? Uh, I would say it's exceptionally damaging to, to uh, what were unbelievably good businesses before this lockdown. We have a few other businesses, uh, coal manufacture, uh, coal mining, uh, uh, essential services in the form of bus transport. Um, we have a concentrated solar operation that we're involved with in Uppington. And we have a television company that continues to broadcast. So we have some businesses that are, are open. We have others, uh, property businesses, for example, where um, you could say it's open, you can say it's closed, depends how you, how, how you look at it. We have, let's say, a thousand inner city um, residences in the middle of Johannesburg. The question is, will those people, when they're locked in their flats, will they be able to pay their rent or not? Uh, it's obvious the longer this thing goes on, uh, the more devastating that will be to a business like ours. So if I sort of summarize our uh, outlook, it's, it's something like this. We've got about 20,000 out of 25,000 people that work in our group that are currently locked out of work or locked down. The cash drain uh, uh, that we see in the underlying businesses is, is pretty devastating for some of those businesses. And they are definitely going to have adverse effects if they are unsupported by government. We see whether this uh, 500 billion rand, which I, I accept is an exceptional step by government to try and assist. We, we see whether that carries us forward. Essentially, um, the, the, the people that have been carrying the can up to now have been banks. They've been not foreclosing where they could, and they've been trying to keep liquidity in the market as they must. And uh, fortunately, 2014, uh, 2020 is a lot better than 2008 from a banking point of view. They all have much stronger balance sheets themselves and have much better capacity to keep liquidity in the market up to a point. So, um, all right, if I look at um, what happens to our employees in particular, every business has to survive uh, as its first uh, operation. And um, in, some, in the case of some businesses, they will not be able to sustain themselves if they continue to pay wages. In the hotel group, for example, we have about 12,000 employees. We paid a third of their wages for, for last month. I reckon that uh, we've spent a lot of time making sure everybody
as a, a UIF application in and, and the rest of it. But I, I reckon if we don't get subsistence uh, help from government this month, we're going to start to be in a situation where we're re relatively forced to pay no wages at all to people who are not working. All right, um, last comment I want to make is um, we, we, we have through our foundation and through our television company launched a, a rather big campaign to try and raise money for uh, uh, feeding. We've raised so far 11 or 12 million rand. We'll convert that into about 30,000 boxes of food, which are enough to supply people's homes for, for a month. We have good connections uh, with various uh, charities, NGOs and the like that we've built up over many years of doing our own foundation's work that are very capable of distributing those boxes. And I'd say that's our major campaign and focus to try and make contribution at a time where we pretty much on our, our knees ourselves. And maybe I, I mean, I, I have one or two more things if I haven't run out of time. Uh, look, the you thing can come back, Johnny. Can I stop you and let you hold them? Don't you'll have another bite. I'm in hold mode. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn now a very different kind of company to Ian Kirk, the CEO of Sunlum, and ask him to respond to the same questions. And you can hear me okay? Yes, great. Thank you. Okay, well, having followed John, I, I, I guess I must be very fortunate. Sunlum has been around for 102 years. It's, it's obviously financially very strong. We don't have, carry any debt and we Obviously, we can meet all our obligations to clients and to employees. And to the extent that we pay rent, we obviously meet all those obligations. But our business uh, is impacted. There's no doubt about it. The markets impact us. But maybe I should explain that when we set up a business like Sunlum, it's set up to handle three economic shocks. We've had one shock. In fact, it's just a bit off now, one shock. So the, the company is very strong. It was set up that way to make sure that, you know, we can meet all our obligations. Um, but of course, one of the nice things, we were able to get ourselves um, listed as an essential service. So we must thank our regulators for that. They recognize the importance that we play to keep the economy going, to support the banking system, et cetera. And that's made life a lot easier. I'm actually, I'm at the office today. But we do have real regulations that, such that 87% of our people are operational but not in the office that was one of the conditions that we you know we had with the regulators and if you'd said to me and that i could we could run salam in south africa 21 and a half thousand people and 87 percent of them are not at the office if you'd asked me that a month ago i said to you it couldn't be done well it's been done now it's been done now it's the third week we're doing it so it's absolutely extraordinary so there are certainly lots of tests of our business continuity plan we run over 200 businesses in 44 countries. So you can just imagine how difficult it is. But as, as I speak to, to you now, everything is, is going well. Of course, it, to some extent it's helped because a lot of the volumes that we would normally deal with are down because the activity in the economy is down. So therefore our volumes are down. So people are probably not as busy as they were. But in the first week, it was particularly t difficult, you know, with everyone concerned and what, what, what's their values and can I get access to money and all that kind of thing. That was particularly tough. But the world is very different for us. We're spending a lot of time contacting our employees. Now, all of us are sitting now in nice fancy offices. If you can imagine 21 and a half thousand people, 87% of them not in the office. They don't all sit in nice studies at home. You know, they're working women, they've got kids. And there's lots of issues like that that we're dealing with that we never thought we'd have to, to deal with. Obviously, we have to be very sensitive to our policyholders. We've have to announce and we've announced throughout our businesses, throughout all the countries, we've announced packages to support our policyholders through this tough time, whether it's by, whether it's by reduction of premium, which we can do because our, our, in areas, certain areas our claims are down. So we've announced substantial reductions in premium where, where we can do that. We've also announced premium holidays to give back to our policyholders. Uh, and of course, we have to spend a lot of time with our stakeholders, regulators in particular. You'd be interested to know that we make daily returns to our regulatory authorities, both the FSCA and the PA. We have a weekly meeting with them because obviously that's in, our, in, in all our interest to make sure the financial system is secure. And we give back to society. You'll have seen we, we 
participated with the Mutsepi Foundation in a billion rand, giving back to provide health care facilities, PPE and food and all that kind of thing, because we can, and I think it's right, Sanlam has been supported by South Africa for 102 years, it's only right that we give back what we can. Um, I think there are positives, people understand our product and the need for our product, but there are a lot of negatives, our clients are concerned about their values, what, what impact does this have on my, on my own uh, retirement plans and that kind of thing that we're dealing with. So I think we're now in the now phase, we'll move into the sort of the next phase, which is trying to ensure that whatever opportunities are around, we will be able to, to do that. You, you asked about um, South Africa, how's South Africa doing? Well, I think South Africa is responding pretty well. Um, obviously, as a financial services business, we're in constant contact with the authorities, with the Treasury to, to play the role. So a lot of the recommendations that we've made have been picked up on. The fiscal stimulus package is a priority. It's, it's, I think generally we're on the right track there. One or two extra things we probably need to do. And the risk adjusted relief from the lockdown, which the president will speak to on Thursday. We've been busy with that, planning with that. And that's going to be really, really important because that's going to take pressure off. Any pressure off the economy, which doesn't obviously impact the, the health imperative, because that's correctly, I think, the priority, will really make a big difference until, it, uh, you know, as, as John was indicating, the banks really sit in the front line in dealing with that. And we sit behind the banks as a savings association. So we all have to do our role to make sure South Africa stays up. The credit guarantee scheme, the 200 billion, is quite a novel scheme. We're obviously, we were involved in the development of that. It's very clever and very appropriate because it's using the banking system to protect small businesses. But big businesses also need support. And that's really where our members come into play. Um, so we're playing a big role there. And I think really what I would say is, all the points about our fiscal position and how weak it is and, and whatever is absolutely true. But it's been said many times, never waste a crisis. And this is a proper crisis, not just for South Africa, for the whole world. So if we can, if we can really take the opportunity now and do all the stuff that we know that needs to be done in the economy to get back on a firm growth uh, path, I think this will be the good that will come out from, from, from the tragedy that we're dealing with. Thanks very much, Ian. I'm now going to turn to Tommy Fanzel, who is the CEO of one of South Africa's largest agricultural businesses. Um, Tommy, you with us? Thank you, Anne. I have unmuted. Uh, my company's name is uh, ZZ2, and we're operating from the Limpopo province, from a rural setting. We're also working uh, in other provinces uh, from Gauteng to Northwest, Kumalanga, Western Cape and the Eastern Cape. We also have operations in Namibia. Our main business is uh, tomatoes, but we're also doing export crops. The tomatoes is only for the local market in South Africa. Uh, our export crops is avocados, apples and pears, medjool dates, uh, low chill cherries and uh, also almonds. Uh, the crisis, uh, the pandemic of the COVID virus has uh, profoundly influenced us, but our business uh, as a food producer is an uh, uh, essential service. And in that sense, we, for the moment, are continuing uh, business, I would almost say as usual. Uh, our first uh, step after the lockdown on the 26th of March was to make sure that we uh, stay to the main cause of the lockdown, which is to keep people safe. Now, working with uh, almost 10,000 people across all these provinces in a rural setting uh, makes it quite a daunting task. We have compartmentalized uh, our operations uh, and we have uh, supported with training programs all our employees, making sure that we decrease interactions and we uh, uh, do social distancing and we supported uh, in a very short time people with sanitizing materials and with uh, uh, 
PPEs. It was very difficult because in those initial phases, uh, everything was bought by somebody else. But slowly, slowly, the materials got uh, trickling back into the industry and uh, we, we have access to all of that. We also had very good uh, interactions with the government uh, and we're all working together to execute the plans. Uh, there's been a profound shift in uh, market demand. Uh, South Africa is a food secure country and the value channels are all functional. Uh, although a shift happened, there's no business in the food service. Uh, there's uh, also uh, much more limited business and I would say the specialty type of products. People have moved back to uh, basic products. So for the basic products, there's a very strong demand. Uh, the demand is even uh, causing prices to rise and we're in a, in a, a, a competitive environment. Supply and demand determines the price. Luckily, we're able to also in this phase in uh, coming up to the winter to have more product than uh, would uh, be available in some other parts of the year. So although there's an increase in the demand, there's an also an increase in, uh, in supplies which keeps a lid on the prices. We don't see at this point in time a problem with uh, the trade and we're getting the product out to our customers. Uh, the existing situation right now uh, is fairly much business as usual for the local market, the export market as well. Uh, the problem that we foresee is if there is an outbreak that would disrupt business and that would make people less safe. At the moment, everybody is safe, but we anticipating that the epicenter might move into one of our areas. And we uh, have protocols, we have a task team working on that to make sure that we're not going to end up in a bad situation. So that's a situation from our side at this point in time. I'll talk a little bit more later. Thank you very much. Um, my last panelist is Alon Litz from who is the general manager of Uber. Alon, over to you. Thanks, Anne, and thanks very much for, for having me on this esteemed panel. Um, I think let me just begin by stating I represent the Uber business in Sub-Saharan Africa. We cover seven countries on the continent, well, in Sub-Saharan Africa, eight across the continent. Um, so I'll be speaking specifically to our response in those countries with a focus on South Africa. Um, taking a step back from that, uh, globally, Uber is in a closed period at the moment. We'll be reporting results in the coming weeks. So I'm not gonna go too deep on any financial metrics. What I can say is that Uber is in a strong position uh, given our RPO last year, uh, we have a relatively strong balance sheet and thankfully a diversified business across product line and also global business, which will protect us um, and hopefully provide some cushioning uh, through the challenging times, which we expect to continue um, for the next few months. Uh, talking to what we did on the employee side up front. Um, so again, we're in the fortunate position to have a global business. Um, so we actually made a call relatively early on in South Africa on the 6th of March uh, to move our corporate workforce to a work from home um, phase. So before the lockdown hits in South Africa and we move, we've also got a driver support element across all the countries where we operate. Um, and we moved that team of over 100 people to work from home to completely remote support a week later on the 13th of March. Um, and what that enabled us to do was continue to provide support to our driver base, but obviously reduce the risk of transmission to any of our direct employees across any of our offices. Uh, we've also ensured that Uber and Uber Eats can continue to operate during their allocated hours. Uber for permitted travel and obviously Uber Eats for the delivery of permitted um, GroCo items, grocery and convenience items. We also took a step back relatively early on uh, to relook at our longer term priorities as a business. And we created capacity within our teams where we could to ensure that we, we could create working groups 
focused on the biggest challenges and opportunities that um, we see facing COVID-19. Importantly, we've got close to 60,000 driver partners across the continent. So whilst these are not employees, it is really important that we keep their best interest in mind through this. Um, so Uber being first in the industry to offer this, we offered a 14 day financial assistance policy to driver partners and couriers. Um, this is a global policy um, for couriers or driver partners who are diagnosed with COVID-19 or ordered to self-quarantine by doctors and, or public health officials. Um, we've also opened this up to individuals with pre-existing health conditions, which would put them at higher risk. So the intention here is to ensure that driver partners are protected in the event that they um, are exposed to the virus and importantly don't put themselves, their families and the rider community at risk if we are notified of a potential infection. Uh, we've also rolled out a number of new features and policies to help ensure um, that health tips and safety tips are, are being made available to our riders and our drivers through this period. We've launched uh, no contact delivery on the Uber Eats side of the business. And we've also launched a PPE um, with an initial focus on surface sanitizer ex expanding into masks, um, a reimbursement policy for our driver partners. We just felt that that was the best way to get stock in their hands as quickly as possible. Importantly, we've also created access to information around the, the latest government financial relief resources available. And importantly, we've spoken to the large banks and vehicle solutions providers across South Africa, um, ensuring that uh, we could speak on behalf of our driver partners and make sure that there are, the necessary relief was made available to them through this period in time. We've also built a number of automated systems, which allow driver partners, as an example, to generate a letter that they can then provide their banks with uh, to um, request the relief directly if that's a financial institution which we haven't spoken to. Um, from a business perspective, we've quickly adapted our technology uh, to offer a product which we call Uber Direct. Uh, I think a consistent theme that we've seen is businesses are struggling with high demand. Um, they can now access uh, high demand for delivery. Um, they can now access our network of drivers and delivery partners to move goods um, to their customers as quickly as possible. And importantly, this also provides further economic opportunities for our drivers and, and couriers. Um, supporting communities is also critical for Uber. Um, we have a global um, um, campaign going live at the moment called Move What Matters, where we're committing free meals and rides to frontline workers. Um, we've also committed to the delivery of essential medicine to homebound patients and food parcels to the most vulnerable. Uh, specifically in South Africa, we partnered with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in the Western Cape, where we're delivering chronic medication to vulnerable patients. And these are individuals who ordinarily would go to the hospital for their medication. And so far in the first two weeks, we've delivered over 25,000 meds out. So I do have more to say, but I'm gonna cut it there and we'll chat again later. Great, thank you very much. Well, what a rich set of experiences and responses to very difficult situation. I think I want to go around again and give you each a chance to um, say something more. Um, let me just throw out a few questions and anything else you want to add? Because each sector is different. So anything you want to add? I think most people are very positive about how the government has responded so far. Anything else you were you worried about or you think they really have to get right in the next sort of phase of this? Do you think your companies, I know, this differs across the sectors, but how will your companies, from this whole experience of trying to operate virtually, how will your company change as you start to reopen and move into um, a hopefully a more normal economic situation? And then the big challenge for the country is we can't just, we've got to find a way to unlock the economy and not let the virus devastate workers and more and more people and overrun the health system. 
But South Africa's big challenge is we can't just go back to where we were, which was a recession. We have to find a way over the next few years to have a chance for economic recovery. So what do you think the key things are in what the president's calling phase three, I think, that he wants to get to of the economic changes that have to be introduced, the economic reforms? Any comments on that or anything else you want to add? Let's, let's go around again, sort of four minutes or so each. I'll start with Johnny because he wanted to uh, um, uh, Is this me, uh, Anne? I, I can't hear you, Anne. Sorry, I said let's start with you, Johnny Copeland. Okay. So, um, look, I just want to say this, that, you know, I think that the first thing is whatever the difficulties that businesses face, what is fundamental is one's attitude, A, to the country, and B, to how can you help? And, uh, you know, to me, what's really encouraging out of every speaker, uh, within whatever limits they have, is a commitment to saying, listen, we can help here, we are helping here, we're going to help here, and we've been thinking a lot about what can we do, rather than sort of whining and bitching about, like, how bad things are, you know? It's that, I think that fundamentally that, that is a, a, a great starting point. If I look at our businesses, you know, for example, if you take hotels, if it's closed, it's closed. I mean, there isn't really much you can do, but there are some things you can do. For example, you can make them available, make the space available for quarantining. Um, uh, convention centers, uh, you can make them available for field hospitals. And that's the sort of space in which we've been talking to, to government about. And as people say, government is very practical, very real about this thing. And I, it's, it's been encouraging to see the level of cooperation there is between business and, um, and uh, government through this period. The, the last comment I want to just make a little bit is that, you know, when you look at an investment holding company like HCI, it has going businesses that have their own problems, but primarily its reason for existing is to invest in new businesses. And we have a number of projects which really are the expansion plans for our business. One, for example, is very caught up in oil exploration off the coast of, of South Africa. Now, the, these things, are, I would say, are fundamental to the future of the country. If, if South Africa is able to find large amounts of oil, no matter all the, the issues around oil, I, I'd say that is, a, that is a game changer for government. It's a source of revenue for government other than taxes that could be very, very transformative. And I, I think that to, to run out of money to invest in those kinds of projects is just terribly, terribly bad timing. Um, the same goes for uh, the establishment of a new platinum mine. Uh, we, we, we're absolutely at the point of getting a mining right now. To have all these delays in, in getting a, a, a new uh, a venture like that, big venture that would be transformative in its own way, I think these are the most terrible pitfalls of, of where we are struggling with. So one way or the other, you know, the first step is to survive. The second is to, to play a positive role in, in a crisis. The third is to keep your eye on the ball of not dropping expansion plans that one has that are essential both to the growth of the company and the country. Great, thank you very much. Some important issues. Um, Norman, would you like to come in now, second round? Yeah, sure. I, I agree with George 100% about the level of commitment that I've come across from everybody saying, what can we do? How can we help? Where, do we, where, where can we make things better, even when things are really dire? Even the issue of employees, I've, I've been working with the Business for South Africa um, uh, effort as well. Lots of employees are suffering because they can't get paid, et cetera, et cetera. But in no case have we seen that it's the employer that somehow just decided, I'm going to take advantage of this. It's just that they are unable to pay them. And, and, and so the big 
having big business and some small businesses and medium sized businesses in an economy i think is a is the way to go because others can help others and so on throughout and we've seen that in the way that ian and i spoke versus say uh, john's particular area in the in, in the hotel space how do we change in in our countries um, we, which have difficult economies and, and so forth and not much capacity for us to get as much as we can out of the economy as soon as possible is really, really important because it means we can generate a bit more capacity to help uh, in the areas that need help. We can generate a bit more capacity to add to the 500 billion that uh, uh, the, the, the president has spoke about. Um, for example, we, almost all our sales are um, in, in foreign currency. And I think at this point in time, when we've got large amounts of imports uh, in terms of medicine, et cetera, et cetera, to get the foreign currency generation going is really quite important so that we can balance things out as we go along. Um, but all of this has to be done with, as I said, how do we keep people safe? How do we keep people healthy? And that comes to, the, to your question of how do we change? Is the issues of masks, for example, we still got lots of discussion about masks, but it seems to me that in the foreseeable future, masks are gonna be the thing that we have to do. The issues of uh, testing for temperatures, there's issues of how we can distance ourselves, the issues of de-densification, um, we had issues, for example, where at the head office, we said, okay, who can work away from, from, from the whole head office? Who can work at home? And we did that. And those who can't work at home, how can we, you know, how can these guys come on the Monday and these guys come on the Tuesday and so forth, so that we have a, a, a much smaller number of people in those offices and therefore a, a smaller risk of, of, of infection. I'm not seeing that those things need to change the moment the president says the lockdown is gone. I think we have to continue with that. Personally, I struggle with the issue of whether I've still got my finger on the pulse as to what is happening when, when I'm not there and I'm not seeing people, etc. I do all sorts of things like what we're doing now and emails and uh, uh, virtual meetings, etc. But I still feel somewhat disconnected and I'm going to have to learn what my colleagues have done and where they are in this so that we can keep the operations and everything going and keep people safe. So that we don't have to have this thing that I often feel that is either the economy or the health. We can have both. And it's very important to see how much of that we can do going into the future. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn now to Ian Kirk. And yeah, dealing first with, uh, you know, Sunlam and the, our industry. I mean, we're very much in the now phase. We're dealing with the issues, with the market impact, dealing with our clients, the operational issues, as I talked about. But we are going to have a, a period now, certainly for the next nine months, that we're going to have to take advantage of the opportunities that are available to us. Some of the stuff that we were busy with around digital transformation is a wonderful opportunity. You know, when our traditional distribution, which is face-to-face, -face, when they're un unable to get access to the clients, either at the work site or at the people's homes or wherever they do the business, we have to operate digitally. So all, all those sort of opportunities uh, the opportunities around some new products for the particular risks that we now face. So I, I see it, the next nine months is quite an exciting time to get stuff done. And then beyond that, I think it's absolutely clear that the world is, as we see it at the moment is, 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 is going to change and change fundamentally for all those businesses. And for our business, 102 years old, you know, traditional insurance businesses, it's going to be fundamentally different. Now, if when I say to you that 87% of our people are working remotely, I mean, what does that mean for summer? Does it mean that we, you know, continue to operate these head office operations as we have at the moment? No. Does it, you know, will we be 
far more automated? Absolutely. Will we have di digital products? Absolutely. We will, will we be delivering those products differently to clients? Absolutely. All the stuff that we talk about is going to get a massive opportunity. I think those, those principles around the now and the next and the beyond will apply to all, all the people who are listening today. As far as South Africa is concerned, and you talk about the phase three, and we're working well together in a crisis. But I mean, Norman and, and John and I, we, we've spent a lot of time for the last 10 years working with labor and working with government. And I think we could say we didn't always work as well together. And, and, and the big opportunity for us is to work together to, to in this phase three to take advantage of the crisis. Now, I'm absolutely convinced that we know what to do whether it's the national treasury plan from August, whether it's a 14 point plan or a 10 point plan. Our problem in South Africa is we haven't implemented the plan. And there's a number of reasons for that. But the first reason is of course, are we aligned around what the priorities are? And I'm not sure we can really say we are fully aligned, all of us, labor, business, government around the priorities. And have we got the ability to get the job done? Can we get the, the work done? Can we implement? And that's all around having the right people in the right job with the right support. And, you know, our fiscal position is pretty dire. It's going to get worse. We're going to have a massive negative year on that. We've had the downgrade. We're going to have a lot of debt. And we have to simply take that opportunity in phase three. And I think that's what the president was, was talking about last night. We have to take that opportunity to fundamentally engineer the, the economy, gear it up for growth, as I said, we know what to do. We just haven't been terribly successful in getting the job done. Um, and, and I think that's the big opportunity. Great, thank you very much. Alon, a few minutes to respond to some of my extra questions. Sure, so I see there's a question from uh, audience member just about the Blim Linda Gates Foundation. We are looking to take that to other provinces and we're speaking to KZ and, and to Gauteng. So people will have more to announce there soon. Um, I think a, a point which I, I didn't get to is um, how difficult this is for our driver partners. Obviously with fewer people moving around, they're, they're feeling um, the knock on their revenues. Um, so really important that we're there from a support perspective. Um, I've been in touch with a number of driver partners just over WhatsApp and we've actually launched an employee scheme where we're, we're phoning our most engaged and um, most loyal driver partners across the continent just to ensure that we're speaking to them proactively to understand what is top of mind on their side and how we can better help them through the situation. I think something else which we're quite encouraged by is the uh, recent announcement by the president last night where it seems like there is now going to be economic relief that extends to independent contractors such as driver partners of careers who weren't officially or necessarily recognized um, with previous uh, rounds of relief. Um, so I do see that as an encouraging step forward. Uh, we're also hoping that with the announcements on Thursday, we are going to see the ability for restaurants to operate in a delivery only environment. Obviously, still important that we can encourage people to stay at home, but based on what we've seen in other countries globally, allowing um, restaurant delivery has been critical to the restaurant industry and it can be done in a way that minimize, minimizes the risk of transmission. Um, I think something else, which I think it was, was Norman who mentioned, was about domestic violence, which unfortunately is, is a plague in the country um, and worse at the moment. Um, so we are announcing a partnership with an organization called NISA, where we're going to help with the transport of victims of um, domestic violence to and from shelters. Um, so that's something which you'll see go live in the coming days. I think what, looking forward um, and fast forwarding, I think it will be a couple of months. I don't think anyone knows for sure how long it's gonna be. And um, I think we're gonna enter a state of new normal before we see the old normal. Um, we're thinking about what does our business look like? Um, definitely additional safety precautions in vehicles, be that things like um, definitely masks for drivers, encouraging riders to, to have masks. You'll in coming weeks see checklists appear in the app before, you take a trip 
um, checking that you've done basic safety steps before going online, one of those recommending that you wear a mask. Um, I think I'm again on time, so I'm gonna cut it there, uh, but it's really thinking about that next step for the business. Great, thank you very much. Tommy Fanzel, a uh, quick few minutes on the general questions I've been posing. Tommy, hello. Yes. Am I unmuted? Okay. So what I'm saying is in our job, in our business, we're uh, preserving jobs. We're even considering to grow the jobs with uh, expansions based on the demand we have for our products locally and internationally. So the immediate situation is to keep people safe and to make sure the way we interact, that we don't uh, expose people. And we are able to do that with compartmentalization. Now people are very decentralized. Looking a little bit into the future, the digitization of uh, our operations uh, in overlap with, uh, I would say, uh, electromechanical abilities or megatronics is going to have a huge impact on our business to the future. And I think we're going to see efficiency improvements in terms of uh, logistics, travel, and very importantly in our business, uh, information exchange or transfer. Uh, we think also there's a huge opportunity for working with government to take the competitive advantage that South Africa has in terms of uh, primary agricultural production in relation to the rest of the world, especially in relation to the East, to open markets. We've been getting access to the Asian markets, especially uh, over and above the US from 1994 until about 2004, and it stopped there. From 2008 up to now, we haven't gained any access into those markets. And if you want to uh, get a low cost in terms of the capital investment needed, job creation system going, you need to get access to these markets. And there's a wide range of products, agricultural products, where South Africa has a competitive advantage. So we're working with government through all our industries to gain access to these markets so that we can uh, get the jobs established uh, that is possible. Uh, I would say, lastly, a real uh, inclusive growth can happen uh, through this crisis. Give uh, improved social cohesion that's developing, taking the focus away from sectional interests and focusing on a common uh, problem like the virus. My thinking is we're going to see a lot of uh, positive effects coming out of this whole event because we have one common enemy and South Africa has a lot to offer to ourselves as a community, but also to the international society. Great, well, thank you very much. We're starting to get a lot of questions. I've tried to pick up some of the issues in my questions. We've got about 10 minutes at most. Um, I want to pose, so one question that I think has really struck home to many South Africans. Um, the vast poverty and inequality in our society has been a key feature of how so many South Africans have struggled to deal with the lockdown and the consequences of where we are now. And so I think this issue is much more front of mind for many people than it has been, unfortunately, in the past. So one question is, what is the, how do we become a more inclusive economy as we start to reopen and rebuild? What would be your one piece of advice on this issue? The second, quite a few questions to Johnny Copeland on any thoughts on the future of the tourism industry, anything you want to, because South Africa was looking to that sector to be a big job creator. 
and now we live in a different world for quite a while. So any thoughts you have on that would be very helpful. But the issue of how South Africa gets to grow and become more inclusive, any quick thoughts on that before I turn to Lori Dipinar in about eight minutes or so? So um, my side, you know, what I would say is this is that look, m markets tend to uh, reflect the picture that is in front of mind. When you're in the middle of a plague and you start saying, well, uh, what's the chances of growth? Everybody says, oh, gosh, there's no chance of growth. The truth of the matter is this plague won't be with us forever. And we are going to get back into a world which is much safer from a health point of view than, than it is today. And a cloud that sits over us is going to diminish. There's just no question that that will happen over time. Will people be interested in traveling at the end of that? I, I've got no doubt that they will. So at some point, you must get back onto the same path where you, you have a beautiful country uh, with the downgrades. We've had a, a much cheaper country to visit. Um, as long as you can preserve the capital that you've got invested in the tourism industry and your hotels don't degenerate, you will have excellent accommodation, excellent restaurants, excellent services of every kind. The key is to be able to make sure that these assets don't degenerate during the period that we're going through uh, at the moment. So I, I am ultimately optimistic for the sector. It is a growing sector. It is a sector where you can't import an alternative. You know, you can't bring a, even if you can say a hotel in India is cheaper and nicer, you can't, you can't stay in that hotel when you come to South Africa. So, um, you know, it is, a, it is a, an area where the country can look to itself uh, for its its own growth and future, and I, I hope it will be a good sector going forward. Great, thank you. Norman, perhaps I can ask you very quickly, how do we become a more inclusive economy as we build? I think um, and in order for us to become an inclusive economy, we've got to bring up the people who who are left out of this economy. Um, we've got to look at the structure of the economy going forward that enables them to come into that economy. We've got to look at how we can grow because without growth, I don't think we're gonna bring anybody else into this economy as much as we would like. To. We've got to get some growth going in this economy. And in the mining industry, I think the scope for growth is huge. Uh, and we're going to put lots and lots more effort and money, and, and I certainly do my part in this, to try and get people educated and educated to a level where they can fit into the new structure of the economy and into that growth, get a decent wage, help their mothers and fathers and so forth and so forth, and get that moving all together as a way of getting people into this economy. That growth is what we need. There was a question, Anne, about how many employees we've got. Anglo Platinum has got about 30,000, and all of them we are able to pay them. They don't need to go to UIF or anything like that. We are paying them their basic pay, their pension, their housing allowance where appropriate, and, and, and so on and so forth. And it's good to have, as I said, people of that you so that where others are unable to do that, uh, we can then look for elsewhere in the economy or from government to help them. But growth is what we need. Tommy Fanzel, how the agri sector is clearly one that everyone's identifying pre COVID that we could grow in, and you're also identifying that, that this is a potential contributor to South Africa's growth. How worried are you about expropriation without compensation to actually making that happen? I don't think that's a big threat to us. The most important resource we have is not the land, it's the knowledge, it's the markets, it's uh, the know-how, it's the networks, it's the ecosystem. Land is but one of the resources we need to have access to. Uh, I think it will be a disaster in terms of uh, our balance sheet 
if such a uh, not well thought through plan will be executed. That will be probably worse than the COVID virus at this point in time. But I think uh, will prevail and I don't think that's going to be a real solution to the problems of South Africa. You can either divide the cake or you can create a much bigger cake. And I think seeing more and more of that happening, if we develop markets globally, wherein we have a competitive advantage, we're going to grow the cake. Uh, so that's what our position is. We want to work with government and with society around us to grow those markets. Then it's going to become irrelevant who's the existing owner of the resources because there will be a redistribution or a resource allocation just created by the numbers forced by the pool, by the demand globally. Chris, thank you. Ian Kirk, two quick questions, if I may. The one is, are we pre-COVID, are we seeing more black South African, black people becoming a part of the insurance industry in South Africa? And how fast is that? Is it good enough? And in, in a minute or so, and then a quick, response to the question of what exactly is the billion rand that Sunlam and Patrice Mutsepi have put together, how are you going to spend that money? Okay, the first, first question talks to the transformation of our sec sector, and I think we'd be the first to say that we could have done better. We've done a lot. We could have done better. And there's a whole lot of reasons why we could, I mean, fundamentally, do we have enough talent for the, in, in, the, in the senior positions and in the technical positions? That's been our problem. Now, we could have invested more, we could have done more 10, 15 years ago, but we didn't. And the, the, the society didn't produce enough through the education system, and those are the explanations. We do not have a choice. We have to push forward with this transformation at every, every opportunity. And it is, it's a very simple business thing. It's got nothing to do with quotas or anything like that. People in South Africa want to do business with, they like doing business with. They need, so the, the people that we employ in our companies have to reflect the markets in which we're servicing. It's as simple as that, whether it's Ireland, Britain, America, or South Africa. And that is the imperative. And uh, I think a lot is being done, a lot more needs to be done. And it's about, it does take a bit of time, we know about the 10,000 hours, you, you know, you can't do it overnight and we have to push away and push away at all levels of our sector. It's not just in the insurance companies, it's also in the supply chain and it's in the distribution, the, the intermediaries. And we're busy, I think, with that. As far as the one billion is concerned, I mean, the, I mentioned earlier from, from the Sanlam side, and I think it certainly applies to Patrice. You know, we've had great success as a business from South Africa. We need to put back, we have some resources to be able to do that. And we're doing it on a coordinated basis. That's why the money that we could have put in, which clearly wasn't the entire billion, um, it just goes further when you put it in on, with associated businesses around Patrice. And he, he has a real, real passion for this thing. He understands it very, very well. He understands the priorities. The money at the moment is being spent, um, I can, that I can guarantee you. And it's being spent, the, the first money is, uh, has gone into, into PPE for the frontline workers. And you see now the health minister is running around the country, traveling around, explaining the, the, the equipment that's being provided to the local authorities. And a lot of that has come from, from, from efforts on, on our part and also from the Solidarity Fund, which we're working in partnership with the Solidarity Fund. The next big thing has got to be... Um, to, to ensure that food gets to the communities. And there'll be a lot of, a lot of money of, the, of that billion that will go to food and the provision of food efficiently into, to deal with the, um, the problem. But of course, you know, there's a, there's a future to this thing as well, which talks about education and ensuring that, you know, our people are properly educated and able to come into society. So some of the money will go into education as well. But um, I think we, again, we talked about the importance of working in partnerships and here we work in partnerships with the Solidarity Fund and other institutions. So it's not that, that we're just gonna do it on our own. We're gonna try and pool our resources and, and make 
you know, a billion sounds like a lot of money relative to the challenges that we face. Trust me, it's not a lot of money. We need, we need many, many billions to deal with this, with this problem. Great, thank you very much. I'm going to now turn to Larry Dipinar for some, his comments, any sort of summary, anything he would like to add to the conversation. Larry? Can you, you. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, I'm gonna make some general remarks and I hope I don't state uh, the obvious. Uh, the first general remark I want to make is, I think for companies, and I'm certainly our companies, uh, it's the, in the current environment, it's about survival, not profit growth or, or dividend growth. Then secondly, I think the society at large was we must try and share the burden, not pass the burden. What I mean by passing the burden, I think we will have read about some big retailers, with strong balance sheets, uh, not paying their rent in malls, okay? rather passing the burden to the uh, mall owner. Uh, it's pleasing to see that uh, in many companies, staff management boards are taking pay cuts and thereby demonstrating this sharing of the, uh, the burden. I think uh, bigger companies that are not as badly affected by COVID can assist small companies in their supply chain. Uh, they know the, which companies they are, and it can be anything from a rapid payment of creditors or paying a creditor in advance, a small company advance, interest to loans, or even a grant. Then companies can be very effective distribution mechanisms uh, pro by providing assistance and injecting liquidity. Now, the best example of that is a bank. Simply by deferring someone's uh, home loan or uh, a higher purchase instalment with a minimum of paperwork, they're injecting liquidity into the system. And obviously, if you repay a credit in advance, you're doing the same. <clears throat> then I think companies can mobilize support, and we're seeing it already uh, on a broad front. Uh, for instance, now at the very, very basic level, a supermarket can have a basket and a, a, its customers can put in a single can of baked beans or frozen food into that and thereby make a donation. Uh, it's just that it's not going to solve the, obviously the food problem, but it makes it, it mobilizes a society. Uh, it's pleasing to see one of the television stations has created a fund and obviously they've got a very broad reach uh, also for food relief. And then just on the big picture. So worldwide, what we're clearly trying to do, everybody, is normalize economic activity and at the same time uh, minimize infections. And I see it like a valve, you know, uh, call it even a steam valve. You open the valve a little, and then you measure the, the, the effect thereof, both economically and on infections. And then if it's a favorable result, you can open the valve a bit further. And if it's unfavorable result, you, you close uh, the valve a bit. Uh, and I think that's the way, uh, and it, it seems to be the approach that the government is already uh, adopting, reading some of their papers. My personal big concern at the moment is uh, food relief. And it's very pleasing to see the government also putting a high priority on it. And I think Ian and them are also helping there. Those are the, the big movers. But it's very important, I think, the smaller food relief uh, local operations are equally important. Firstly, they know their constituency. They know who actually needs the food. It's not a long paperwork and red tape finding out who qualifies for a food parcel. They actually know them. And then obviously they're very nimble. I had an example here where I am a lockdown in Plate, where uh, a lady looks after car guards, just as a little example. Got the money in the evening, by the next morning, they had food parcels. So I just think it's very important that uh, over and above the big money that's going into food relief, these little uh, organizations at local level also need to support, they, they fulfill a critical role because they're quick off the mark. Thank you, Anne. Thanks very much, Laurie. Well, I think that's an excellent point which to stop what I think has been a fascinating conversation. Somebody said globally that South African business have been one of the most quick, quickest sectors in the world to mobilize and to get a whole lot of things going. I think in addition to that, we're seeing what individual companies are doing 
from the members of our panel today. Um, thank you very much for participating. For those of you whose questions didn't get answered, I'm very sorry, but it's been a fantastically rich panel and we really appreciate the time CEOs, chairman and general managers have taken, especially with all the pressures on you to participate in this today. Thank you very much. We have another event on Friday. If you want to participate in discussion on South Africa's public finances, Michael Sachs has written a paper on this and we have him, a former Deputy Director General in the Treasury and we have two people from the private sector who are going to respond to that. So go to, so we have that event, please join us there. Thank you very much everybody. Thanks for participating and this will be up on our website as soon as we can. Thank you very much.